Bismillah. So we continue. We are uh, we are talking about Musaylama. Okay. So the Prophet ﷺ was really upset about this. It's hard to overestimate the Prophet ﷺ being of how upset he was about this. Um, is it common for Rasulullah ﷺ to call people names? Can anyone think of another person Rasulullah ﷺ called, called, like made fun of their name, mocked their name? Can you think of it? Like Abu Jahl wasn't, like his actual kunya was actually Abu Hakam. It wasn't Abu Jahl. But that was given to him by Allah, not by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Rasulullah Alaihi Salatu Wasallam, it's very interesting because the person, the person who's like always fahish, they curse like all the time, it means nothing anymore. Whereas a person who never curses, if you see them getting upset and like telling someone off like that, you're like, wow, this guy's really upset, right? This is exemplary. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi never used to call people names. But this is an issue, the false claim of prophecy, this is actually an issue in which it's a sunnah to call that person a name. To deprecate that person. Why? Because that person made a claim and it's such a horrible false claim that it, is, uh, uh, it literally will cost people their, their, their eternal life. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi actually called this person Musaylama. And the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they didn't take it lightly either. Uh, and so what ends up happening is Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam passes away very very shortly after this incident. The Sahaba radiyallahu anhum they gathered an army and they actually went and fought uh, Banu Hanifa. Banu Hanifa is Musaylama's people. Uh, most of there were some of them some Hanafis like if you have if you read the books of hadith the the uh, the Nisba of Hanafi doesn't always mean Hanafi Madhab. Later on it means Hanafi Madhab. In the early, the first generation, Hanafi means from Banu Hanifa, from the tribe Banu Hanifa. And so the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, even though there were a couple of Hanafis who were actually Muslims, they didn't, they didn't fall for this and they didn't buy this nonsense. But a majority of Banu Hanifa, because there's jahiliyyah, they didn't know any better. It's not like they're living in Medina and like, you know, like taking the deen from its source. So they don't know what's the difference between right and wrong. They're still in the mindset of jahiliyyah, so they, 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 they supported, they supported uh, Musaylama because it, to them it was like, this is our guy, we're just going to back him up, right? So there was a battle that happened uh, at the fortifications of Banu Hanifa in a place called Yamama. Yamama is, is still, it's, that place is still actually inhabited in, in the Arabian Peninsula. You can, you can like look it up, you can look it up on the map. It's not all that far from, from Medina, it's a, a little bit inland uh, in, into the... Uh, into the uh, Arabian Peninsula. So they fought them in Yamama, uh, which is a place in Najd. And uh, um, it was a very pitched battle. It was a very difficult battle because these people were themselves like tough Bedouin warriors. And a number of the original Muhajirun, those original Sahaba that were the first ones to accept Islam at the hands of the Prophet ﷺ, a great number of them were martyred at this battle. And a great number of the Hufaz of the Quran were martyred at this battle. So many of them were martyred that uh, until this point, the Sahaba were petitioning Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq to write the Qur'an down in a written form. Hitherto it was preserved, everybody knew what the Qur'an was, but it was preserved through orality. It was the oral transmission, oral tradition. Remember this, Islam is an oral tradition. First oral tradition, then afterward everything is written down later. But first it's lived, then it's written down in books later. So the, 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 the Qur'an was memorized like from mushafahatan, from one person's lips to the ears of the next person, before it was written down. So they were petitioning Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, why don't you compile a, a copy of the Qur'an in one place? He says, how can I do something that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never did? Because of the battle of Yamama was such a difficult, hard-fought battle, and so many hufaz of the Qur'an were martyred at that, that battle, Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq was, was then persuaded that yes, so that nobody afterward will make an objection that the, that the Qur'an, they somehow lost it or they changed it, let's write it down right now while there's still a few of the original Hufaz that are still alive. Otherwise, uh, um, Abu Hudayfa and his freed slave Salim, Abu Hudayfa was the brother of Hind bin, bint Utba. Right? Hind was the, the wife of Abu Sufyan. Uh, Abu Hudayfa was her brother. He accepted Islam and his uh, slave accepted Islam. And the slave was a very, uh, a very intelligent person. Right? The sla the Salim, his uh, slave, was a very intelligent person. So the two of them would go in Makkah Mukarramah before the, 
before the hijrah, they would go to the Prophet ﷺ and sit with him. And Salim would memorize the, the, the words of the Qur'an and then he would go back and teach his master. And so you see Islam does stuff like this, that the slave now becomes, has a higher role than the, the master does. Salim was one of the original hafaz of the Qur'an. And Salim actually, uh, uh, Abu Hudayfa will free him. And Abu Hudayfa will adopt him as a son before the adoption is uh, uh, revoked, the custom of adoption is revoked by, the, by, by uh, the, the, the revelation. But he'll actually adopt him as a son. And he will, uh, the two of them are inseparable in life. And they're also shaheed fi sabilillah. Both of them are hafaz of the Quran. Both of them were shaheed in the path of Allah Ta'ala at the battle of Yamama. They took this very seriously. The Sahaba radiallahu anhu took this matter very personally, the matter of the khatm al of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in fact, do you know what the, the battle cry was on the day of, uh, uh, on the, day of uh, the battle of Yamama? People know the battle cry of the Muslims was on the day of Badr was Ahadun Ahad, right? Invoking the help of Allah by calling His name, meaning that these are all mushrikeen. If they win, then nobody's going to worship you alone. So the battle cry on the day of Yamama was Wa Muhammada. It's literally the form is the form of istighatha. Right? But the meaning was what? Ya Allah, we invoke your help with regards to your Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That if you want anyone to believe in the integrity of the Nubu of your Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, give us help on this day because these people are trying to completely destroy it. They're trying to completely muck it up. So the battle cry on the day of Yamama was what? Wa Muhammadah. This is actually a proof for, against those people who say that istighatha is like shirk and things like that. Uh, the idea is the tafsil in it, right? If you mean it, with shirk then it's shirk but if the intention in it is that seeking the help of Allah Ta'ala through, through the barakah of whoever, whoever whatever name you're using then it's actually permissible it's not kufr but at any rate on that, on, that, uh, on that day they won the battle in the open field and so Banu Hanifa retreated into their fortifications and they locked the doors because they got beat in the open battle, uh, battlefield but Musaylama was still alive and the battle wasn't over so the Sahaba radiallahu anhum they sieged they sieged the uh, 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 um, they sieged the uh, uh, the fortification. So people, uh, you know, anyone heard the hadith before? It's I mean, it's in Riyadh al-Salihin. Maybe like sitting in Ta'lim in the masjid or whatever, you may st- must have heard it before. There's the hadith of Abu Dujana that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam at one of the battles he uh, 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 he held a sword and said, "Who will take this from me and fight with it?" And everyone said, "Ya Rasulullah, I will." And uh, uh, he says, "Who will give its haq?" And everybody stopped for a moment to think, what does that mean? Abu Dujana didn't stop. He just said, I will, Ya Rasulullah. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave it to him. Right? What was the haqq of the sword is that you fight either until victory or until you're killed, that you don't hold back. So everyone stopped for a second. And then Abu Dujana, uh, who's from the Ansar, he, he, didn't, he didn't hold back. He just went forward and took that sword. You remember this, this, this hadith. And then he takes the sword and he vaunts in front of the army. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says to him, uh, uh, Abu Dujana, uh, if you did this at any other time and place, you would be the most hated person to Allah. Meaning, like such a show of, such a show would be considered arrogance. Allah would hate you for it. But in this time, in this place, you're doing this. You're the most beloved one to Allah Taala. Which means what, right? It's good to have akhlaq, be humble, this and that. There's 99% of the time this is what the, the character of a Muslim is. But sometimes when it's time to stand, that's the time that you that being humble and meek is a sin. Right? In the Midan, when you come and the battle is, battle is started, at that point, don't be... <laughs> no. That time, that's a sin. That's the thing Allah hates. So what happens is that uh, Zubair bin Awam, radiallahu anhu, he says, he says, I was wondering, like, who is this guy? The Prophet ﷺ gave him the sword, and like, what's better about him than me? Because Sayyidina Zubair bin Awam also, he's a tough guy. You know, he's, a good, he's a great warrior, he's a tough guy. So he says, I want to see, you know, what's the big deal with this guy, Right? So he says that I followed him back. He went into the camp of the Ansar. And uh, the, he, he heard the Ansar whispering that he's putting on the Isabat al He's putting on the turban of death. They're all whispering the turban of death, the turban of death. And so he sees that he put on a red turban on that day. And then in the battlefield, he said, I, I would look for the red turban in the battlefield. All I'd see, I'd see the, 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 the flailing of like the, the red turban because the eye catches the color, right? So I would see the red turban flailing in the air. And I would see dust come up, and then when the dust settled, there's just like bodies like uh, around. So this Abu Dujana, he, how, how did he die? He was actually martyred on the day of Yamama. 
He jumped the gates when the Banu Hanifa retreated into the fortification. He jumped the gates and he fought the, the gatekeepers off single-handedly and he opened the gate. And he ran out of the gate to come back and join the Muslim army. They didn't best him in battle. Rather, when he was running, he tripped and fell and then they, 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 they uh, martyred him. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Right? Who else was there on the battle of Yamama? You, you, you know the story of Harb, Wahshi bin Harb. Wahshi is the one who assassinated Sayyidina Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu. You remember uh, Hind, she, she promised him that if you kill him on the battlefield, he just showed up with the javelin, he didn't, uh, he, he didn't uh, participate in the battle at all. She just said, kill this one person and I'll free you and I'll give you your, your uh, weight in silver. Uh, and so he did it, not, not, not knowing any better, out of jahl he did it. And so afterward he becomes a Muslim as well and he feels great regret for what he had done. That he caused taklif to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the people who were, whose, whose deen is, would have uplifted him, he's fighting against them and he's harming them and the people whose deen is, uh, had kept him in slavery, he's serving, he felt very great regret about this. This was something that, that haunted him until he died, he felt regret about it. And so what happened, he showed up on the day of the Battle of Yamama, he said, I brought my same spear, the same javelin with, with him. And his niyat was that I'm going to, his intention was that I'm going to, uh, I'm going to make kafara, uh, toba, and I'm going to make kafara, I'm going to, I'm in, I've, I've repented and I'm going to expiate for the sin of having killed Sayyidina Hamza radiallahu anhu by taking out this, this musaylama on this day. This is going to be how I'm going to make up for it. And he did, he found him on the battlefield and from far away, he uh, hit him with a, uh, uh, with a, with a precise uh, throw of the javelin. Uh, he hit him and he, uh, he dispatched him from, his, uh, from the misery, misery of his existence. Uh, and look at what happened. This is a genius and the beauty of Islam as well that Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq ordered that, uh, radiallahu anhu, that the, the, the captives, the, the prisoners that they captured from Banu Yamama after all of this was said and done, Instead of, instead of executing them, which is what they would have deserved, but this is the, the ijtihad of Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. He said, go and tell them about the deen now. Explain to them, like, this is what the real Islam is. Your dude was just trying to scam you guys. He goes, this is what the real, what a Nabi really is, what a Rasul really is. And so explain it to them and call them to Islam, call them to the deen. And see what they say. And those people, they repented and they accepted the deen and they say, we didn't know what this, that this is what it was about. In fact, Tuleha, I mentioned, Banu Asad is also from Rabi'a. Tuleha was one of the claimants to false prophecy. He actually was, uh, 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 he, him and, him and, him and uh, um, Musaylama were actually, they joined forces. So Tuleha was actually captured on that day. And Tuleha himself, he repented. Because he, he's just, I'm just running this guy. He himself repented. He accepted Islam and he, participated in the conquest of Iraq and he died on Iman. But what the, say this is the ijtihad of Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq, right? Not, okay, so it's easy to get wrapped up in the emotion. What they did was really bad. It was really bad. Imagine how bad that will look in front of Allah Ta'ala that you lied and said you were a Nabi and just to take advantage of people. It's really bad. It's not good. A person should not have no sympathy in their heart for that action whatsoever. However, a human being does dumb things and they're still a human being. So Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, he said what? Pre preach to them and tell them about the error of their ways and offer them repentance that you can, you can make good after the bad thing that you did. Allah Ta'ala will forgive you. You can make good and turn your life around for the better and they accepted it. These are the people, by the way, they end up, Banu Hanifa and all these people, they're the ones that end up conquering Iraq afterward. They're the ones who end up becoming the armies of Islam afterward. They didn't know any better. The reason I mentioned to you is this is what, you know, obviously the people who accepted the nubuwa of, of, of uh, Musaylama, they're gone. They've been gone for centuries. But there are people who accept false, false prophets now that are still here, right? So there's a jamaat in, in Canada, they, they call themselves the Ahmadiyya, right? Uh, and uh, our ulama forbade us that don't just call them Ahmadi. Why? Because Ahmad is the name of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa and they have no nisbah to him whatsoever. They believe in Mirza, the, the false prophet of Qadian. Uh, Mirza was such a, 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 a foul individual that he used, to, he used to sit on the mimbar in his masjid. And uh, uh, he used to, in the same khutbahs that he would c c call himself a prophet, he used to curse. He used to uh, say uh, those words that are censored that you cannot say on TV. 
Imagine every source of indecency is on TV, but there's some things even on TV they won't show. Those words that you won't say on TV, he would curse out people he didn't like. He would curse out their mothers and their sisters. He was completely a, a foul-mouthed person. The tongue is an interpreter for what the reality is inside the heart. That this man had a number of ajib and strange foul habits, uh, uh, but he claimed he was, a, he was a nabi. There are people who follow that jamaat to this day, and they literally, they have a very robust propaganda system and a majority of their propaganda is just bad-mouthing the Muslims. Now tell me, is that good? That someone should believe in such a man and somebody should uh, uh, follow them and serve their, their deen? Absolutely not. But you should also use hikmah as well when talking to them, dealing with them. Convince them, say, look, the Qur'an came down on the Prophet ﷺ and it produced a civilization. What are you guys? You guys are just, you have like a Twitter account and a Facebook account. Like, what, what have you done? Like, no one from the nations of the earth has uh, accepted your deen, except for one or two people. It's been so many generations have passed since the 1800s. It's been a long time. You guys have done nothing. You pray five times a day. You recite the same Quran, etc., etc. Just, you know, recognize that this is, this is like the, your guy who claimed a, he was a nabi. He wasn't a nabi. Just become a Muslim again. What's wrong with saying this? This is what they're afraid of. You know that, by the way, when you go to their, their, their places of worship, I wouldn't call them a masjid, but when you go to their places of worship, and we talk about the Jummah Khutbah, like be good to your parents, we talk about the Jummah Khutbah, you know, like, you know, the importance of mercy and the importance of the remembrance of Allah and the importance of, you know, these, all these different things. These are the teachings of the deen. Their khutbah every single week, all it is, oh, the Muslims, you know, they persecute us so much and they'll kill you and they'll this and they'll that. How many days of your life go by and you even think about them, much less persecute them or be, anyone here beat up a Qadiani before? No, we have, better, better, we have our own lives to live. It's not the, it's, it's, it's batil, it's completely spur, vain, there's no truth in it. And we'll, we'll say it openly. Why? Because we take the integrity of the message of the Prophet ﷺ very personally. The khatm al is very important. That's why we don't call them Ahmadi. We say Qadiani. Qadiani is they say, oh look, the, 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 the Sunnis are bigoted and they, they use this derogatory word, Qadiani. It's not derogatory. Qadiani is the, 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 the city that they're, the person that they claim is a Nabi is from. Imagine if someone called you Madani. Are you going to say, oh, this guy said this really bad word to me? He's like, no, Medina, we love Medina. That's like an honor. Like, I don't deserve that honor. Someone should say this person is from Medina. Allah Ta'ala, if Yom Qiyamah, if I'm like considered Madani, I'd be like, well, this is like such a, it makes a person happy to think about Medina, right? So, so we call Qadiani as a matter of fact, as a statement of fact that their, their, their person, we say, okay, he's not a Nabi, but it's not like it's like a bad word or a cuss word. It's just saying that he's from the village of Qadian. That's, that's all. So the Qadianis, that's the neutral term that our, our ulama used to use to describe them. Because Ahmad is who? Ahmad is the name of the Prophet who lived 1400 years ago in, in Arabia. He has nothing to do with this village in Punjab. Neither is the Prophet ﷺ the Mirza's ancestor, nor does he, Mirza conform to his deen. Why is it that you're using, you have to insist to use the name of the Muslims in order to describe your deen? Your religion is a separate religion. So this is this, this deliberate obfuscation of the Khatm al-Nubu'ah of the Prophet ﷺ, this is actually something that the Muslims deal with to this day. And you cannot, be, you cannot waffle on this issue. And the reason I bring it up, I mean, it may be like to the group of people that's here, it may be like common sense that this is a, a common sense issue that they're not Muslims, but we have people now that are quote unquote political or whatever leaders in the Muslim, in the Muslim community in America that will say stuff like this. Like anyone know who Linda Sarsour is? Yeah, okay, so she's a very, she's a very uh, prominent political activist. She wears a hijab and she organized the Women's March and she comes on CNBC and et cetera, et cetera. And she gets invited to large Muslim conferences and things like that. So what happened? The Qadiani uh, 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 group, they actually did a lot of da'wah in America in like the 30s, in the 1930s, to the African-American community. So there are a number of African-American Qadianis in America. And in fact, interestingly enough, many of the African-Americans who are actual Muslims, their, their grandfathers, great-grandfathers first became Qadiani, and then they afterward realized, oh, these guys have, this is not really Islam. These guys were just scamming us. This is another group, and then afterward they become, they become Muslims. So there's an African-American Qadiani, by the, by, by, African -American Qadiani who won a, uh, 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 um, an Oscar a couple of years ago. Right? He won an Oscar. For what? Get this. 
he's a black guy and he played a drug dealer in a movie and he won an Oscar. And so our, you know, this sister Linda Sarsour, she tweeted out black and Muslim. Had she, by the way, had she recanted and made Toba for this, I wouldn't have mentioned her name. But she did this publicly, it's wrong. These things need to be called out. She said, what? Oh, I'm so proud of you, congratulations. Hashtag black and Muslim. Anybody who believes in the nubuwa of somebody after the Prophet wasallam, this belief is kufr. It's disbelief. Now I want you to understand something. A belief may be kufr, but there's a difference between identifying a belief as, as being kufr and then saying that a person is a kafir. A person, there's a difference between the two of them. Maybe a person says something and they didn't think about what they said or they didn't mean it. At any rate, even maybe a person is through that belief a kafir, but at any rate, the fatwa of takfir saying that this person is a Muslim, this person is not a Muslim. In general, uh, it's the function of, the, of the, the, the qadi, of the judge, and it's part of taqwa that you don't. Uh, uh, that you don't give fatwa if you're not required to give fatwa. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum, when they were asked about fatwa, you know, they would basically pass the buck. They say, go ask so-and-so, they know more than me. They weren't ready to give fatwa. So put the issue of takfir aside for, for a second. But unfortunately, uh, 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 for people who say such things, to say that such a person is a Muslim that believes in a Nabi after the Prophet wasallam, this is kufr. So this must be mentioned. This issue must be mentioned. It needs to be mentioned. And so this, this uh, and, and just on a completely social level, right? A black guy played a drug dealer in a movie. This is not something to be proud of. This is something to be offended that they're just perpetuating a stereotype. Imagine like some Arab guy plays like terrorist number four in a, in a movie and they get a, they get a, a, a award for it. We're going to be like, what a sellout. <laughs> what a complete sellout. This guy is just trying to act like a clown in front of, uh, in front of the mainstream and like you know, put all of us down uh, in order to make a, a quick buck and make themselves famous because nobody's ever going to give them the lead role, right? So a black guy plays, ter plays a, 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 a drug dealer in a movie and he, uh, he gets an award for it. And uh, unfortunately, our people are, and everyone who t retweets it, and people are, oh, look, you know, like uh, black and Muslim. Not Muslim. It's not Muslim. What are, what are you going to do about it? This person, uh, uh, this person believes in a Nabi after the Prophet Wasallam. Don't let these stupid things become a fitna in your iman. Don't let these things be like someone, you know, if you put, uh, if you put like a cup of sand in someone's gas tank, what's going to happen to the engine? The car can be the nicest car in the world, it's going to destroy it. Don't let this be like the cup of sand in the gas tank of your deen. A person is not a Muslim. Does it mean that, oh, look, Mulan Asab is saying we should go and smash their windows in and kill them? No, I'm not saying any of those things. But at least inside of your in your mind, right? This is Aqidah class. Like at least inside of your heart, you should dislike it, like the Sahaba radiallahu anhu disliked it. And inside of your mind, you should know this is not Islam. This is so incompatible with Islam that that there that there's a chasm between this and Islam. The two of them don't even touch one another. Uh, uh, and so that's what that is. There's another group, for example, in North America that's very famous that violated the, the Khatam al-Nabuwa, the Prophet ﷺ, in the name of Islam because of which it was kufr, which is the, the group known as the Nation of Islam, which is neither a nation nor is it Islam, that a, 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 a man from the south side of Chicago in the 50s uh, by the name of Elijah Poole, he claimed that uh, uh, God came to him in the form of a rug merchant from the east. As if Allah Ta'ala has no occupation better than selling rugs. And so the rug merchant from the east, God came to him in the form of a rug merchant from the east and told him, you're my messenger and I give you the name Muhammad. And that was uh, that rug merchant from the east. His name was Master, really honestly, this is, you cannot make this stuff up. He says he's in Master Fraud. Master Fraud. They literally say Master Fraud. Okay? They spell it F-A-R-A-D, but they say Master Fraud. Okay? Master Fraud came to me, he's God in the form of a man. He came to me and he said that you're, you're, you're Muhammad, you're my messenger. Okay? And one of the teachings of the Nation of Islam, the Nation of Islam, their teachings are so wacky, wacky like out of, out, out of league with, with the, they don't believe in the Akhira, they, 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 don't, believe in, uh, they don't believe in so many basic uh, tenets of the deen, but they call themselves the Nation of Islam, have nothing to do with Islam, except for, they, they, and they write in big, posters on their, on their, or big boards on their places of worship, right? They call them temples, right? Uh, and then they started calling them mosques later, right? So they say, there is no God except Allah, and Muhammad is a messenger. But when they say Allah, who do they mean? They mean Master Fraud, the rug merchant from the East. And when they say Muhammad, who do they mean? Elijah Poole. Al-ibratu bil ma'ani la bil al-fad, right? The, 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 the judgment will be according to reality. It's not going to be according to the words. 
So someone, and this is something really interesting, even with the Qadiani issue, some uh, people who are not, not, not uh, 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 connected with the deen, they say, how can you say that the Qadianis are not Muslims when they say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah? You don't have a right to say they're not Muslims. Well, what about these other guys? They also say that there's no God except for Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. But by Allah, they're talking about who? Master Fraud. And by, by Muhammad, who are they talking about? Elijah Poole. It should be obvious that, 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 that that's kufr. This brings up another important issue, which is what? You can use the right names and you can say the right words, but if inside your mind and inside your heart you don't conceive of it properly, you don't have iman. Which is important. Why? Because people who never bother to learn anything about the deen, how are they going to conceive of things properly? That's why things like darses, like the dars of aqidah, it's an important thing. We've thrown it behind our back. It's very important. It's, it's something that we've ignored to our own detriment. At any rate, this uh, quote-unquote nation of Islam, and this is, this is the fun part, right? When something is kufr, no one said kufr was supposed to make sense. In fact, kufr makes no sense whatsoever. And Allah Ta'ala, in certain comical ways, He shows how, how, uh, 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 how these things don't make sense. So one of the tenets of the belief of the nation of Islam is that the white man is the devil. Now, I'll admit that some white people are the devil. Some black people are the devil too. It has nothing to do with your race. Definitely, this is not a belief of Islam that people of a certain color are the devil, whether they be black, white, or brown in the middle, or whatever else, purple, or whatever else they may be. Right? So they, it's a tenet of their faith to believe that the white man is the devil. And guess what color Master Fraud is? If you look, they actually have a picture of him that they carry around and they publish in their books. The guy is actually white. It's really, none of it makes any sense whatsoever. None of it makes any sense whatsoever. Why do I mention this? This is someone's like comical. This is like, Shaykh, I didn't come on a Saturday morning just to learn that this is not Islam. I, I would have figured that out without your bayan. Well, guess what? We have people in, in, in America that, that are like, well, you know, we owe the nation of Islam a debt of gratitude for is introducing Islam to America. What? These are major national prominent figures that say stuff like this. They literally, they say, they say things like this. And the fact of the matter is that, uh, you know, Elijah Poole was a serial philanderer. He would uh, lure in his uh, uh, unsuspecting female, young female followers. He fathered, fathered a number of children out of wedlock. I mean, the guy was essentially, he was a Dajjal. Malcolm X, who is, you know, arguably one of the more, most celebrated figures in North America, in the history of Islam in North America, they killed him. Because he, at some point, realizes, first he realizes Elijah Poole is a fraud. Second, he realizes this is not even the real Islam. So he actually makes Toba, becomes a real Muslim, goes for Hajj and starts telling people what the real Islam is. And uh, uh, the nation, they, uh, the, they actually sent their gunmen and they killed him, they shot him. Uh, and this guy, what's his name? Louis Farrakhan. You know who Louis Farrakhan is? Louis Farrakhan is Cal Calypso Louis. He used to be a Calypso lounge singer. And uh, he was a very uh, smooth and eloquent speaker. You can go look up his YouTube videos, right? He's uh, smooth, but he speaks with a forked tongue. Uh, none of what he says means anything, but he's very smooth at what he said. He actually said it in a bayan. He basically said he gave a bayan to his followers of his religion uh, uh, because he stayed with that, that nation group. He said that Malcolm had it coming, you know? He should have kept his mouth closed. Why is it that our Muslims are so stupid that we, we somehow think that this has, we, Muslims owe a debt to, of gratitude for these people introducing Islam to the public? In fact, many people in America, many African Americans, one reason that they don't want to come to Islam is because they think they're like, oh yeah, the white man is the devil. That's just all nonsense. We don't believe that. And you have to explain to them, no, 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 no. there's a difference. We're not, that has nothing to do with, 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 with our group, with our Islam. Why do I bring this up? Okay, fine. I really, honestly, I don't think anyone in this group is going to go run off and join the nation. Most of its members itself have left because they know it's a fraud. But the interesting thing is that the kufr of these people is so bad that even sympathy toward them itself is a defect in your iman. Don't say that these people did anything good. These are the worst of Allah Ta'ala's creation. Allah Ta'ala, if, if He doesn't like a person, He won't make them pious. If He doesn't like them more then he'll take iman from them. If he hates a person, he'll make them like what? A, a murderer. <laughs> if he hates a person, he'll imagine Hitler, his punishment in the hellfire is not going to be the, like the same punishment of like Jim who says, I don't believe in God. He just sees smoke weed, but he doesn't like bother anybody. They're not going to be the same in the hellfire. 
if he really hates a person, what's the punishment worse than Hitler? Hitler did all sorts of crazy stuff. He's a horrible person. Did he ever claim he's a Nabi? This is what our Aqidah says. This is a very bad sign. We don't, we don't see any khair in these people whatsoever. You hate it in your heart and you, you, you declare it on your tongue. The rest of it, you know, if you're not in sovereign authority, the other issues don't pertain to you. So this is, this is important. Now, this is the negative aspect of the Khatm al that you negate the, the false prophethood of other people. But there's a positive aspect of Khatm al that very few people mention. Which is what? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is a Khatm al and he's a seal of the prophets. But his Nubu'ah, which means what? His Nubu'ah is valid until the Day of Judgment. Who is the one who administers his Nubu'ah after he leaves the, this world? Al-Ulama'u warathatul anbiya وَإِنَّ الْأَنْبِيَاءَ لَمْ يُوَرِثُ دِنَارًا وَلَا دِرْمًا وَإِنَّمَا وَرِثُ الْعِلْمَ فَمَنْ أَخَذَهُ أَخَذَ بِحَظٍ وَافِرٍ That the ulama are the, uh, uh, the ulama, the people of knowledge, are the heirs of the prophets. The heirs are what? The people who are closest to the prophet in kinship. Meaning the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa physically may have left this, uh, this ummah. However, his nubuwa is administered to this ummah through what? Through the, anbi- uh, through the ulama. The ulama, because what are all the different, the different jobs of a Nabi, right? The most important job is to receive revelation. That's done. Who's the one who preserves the revelation and teaches it after him? It's the ulama. What is the jobs of the Anbiya, Ali Musa'at wasalam? They're the ones who judge between, people's, uh, 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 between people in their, in their disputes. What, are the, what was the job of the ulama? He's the one who, who teaches people how to live, right? Theoretically, it's one thing to know how to you know, recite tajweed, you know, this is how, this is how you do ghunna, min qablu, right? That's a theoretical issue, right? But how are you going to teach the people how to, how to live? If the, if the knowledge is a science, then teaching people how to live is an art. This is also what the Prophet ﷺ did. All of these different jobs... Uh, that, are, that are continuing. Receiving wahi is not continuing, it's complete, it's done. Rasulullah did it and he transmitted the wahi to us. Then afterward, transmitting the wahi on, propagating it, teaching people how to live, preserving, propagating that knowledge, judging be- between people in their disputes, right? Uh, 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 teaching people the spiritual teachings of all of these different functions that the Prophet did, they're carried on in this ummah by whom? By the ulama. So the institution of the ulama is how the khatm al is administered, right? The nubu of the Prophet ﷺ is administered to the ummah. Now tell me something. Oh, janab, mulvi on Islam, no kharab ki ta hai. If somebody, somebody says, oh, the, all, the, all the mulvis, all the ulama are the ones who ruined Islam, they're all backwards people. Is this, this objection, if you, if you hate the ulama, then who is the objection against? Rasulullah ﷺ, he's the one who says that they're my heirs. Who are your heirs? Who inherits from you? Your like f- fifth cousin doesn't inherit from you. Who inherits from you? You're the next of kin. If you have a, a son, your brother will not inherit from you. If you have a brother, your uncle will not inherit from you. If you have an uncle, your cousins will not inherit from you. The one who inherits from you is the one who's the closest to you. So the objection against, oh, it's one thing, okay, fine. There may be a particular alim, right? You say, well, I saw Mulvi Hamza, you know, uh, shoplifting uh, uh, m and Smarties at the, at the superstore, you know? Okay, this guy, maybe there's a problem with him as Hamza. But not because of the ilm, it's just because of him as a person. It's permissible, it's not kufr to like have beef with a particular person who happens to be a person of knowledge. But the idea that a person has a beef with the class of people of knowledge, that the studying the Qur'an, studying the hadith, studying fiqh, studying uh, aqidah somehow makes you into like an ignorant or closed-minded person or whatever. This belief itself is actually kufr. Again, I'm not making takfir on an individual, but this is a very harmful and dangerous belief. Why? Because the Rasul says, khatm al is permanent until, until the end of time. Why? Because if it wasn't, then one could say that there's a need for, there's a need for Nubu'ah to come back. There's no need for Nubu'ah to come back until the end of time. The Nubu'ah of the Prophet Sallallahu the custodians of it are, in, in specific the ulama and in general the ummah. The ummah by accepting what the ulamas teach, the ulama by preserving what the knowledge of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, what the speech and the words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, what the words of the Qur'an are, and what the ahwal, the, the spiritual states of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are. And it's a part of Iman to love those people. Again, if you have a specific, a specific disagreement with a specific person, not because he's a, or she's a person of knowledge, but just because of personality, that's different. 
Or if there's a alim who's saying something within the ambit of differences of opinion and you don't agree with that one opinion but you take another opinion in it, that's fine. That's not what I'm talking about. Like, you know, uh, Mulan and Nabil comes and says, yeah, okay, after today, you know, like I better say jump and you say how high. That's not what I'm saying. Although he's a nice guy, you should listen to him too, mashallah. But the idea is this, is that, and not that he would ever say that, but the idea is that, you, you know, that, that this reverence and love in general inside of the heart of a believer of the ulama is actually... Not only is it reverence and love of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it is the mechanism through which the Khatm al of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is positively uh, 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 honored in the Ummah. وَهُوَ الْمَبْعُوثُ إِلَىٰ عَمَّةِ الْجِنِّ وَكَافَةِ الْوَرَىٰ بِالْحَقِّ وَالْهُدَىٰ وَبِالْنُورِ وَالْضِيَاءِ He is the one Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who was raised to the uh, generality of the, the jinn and uh, the generality of, of humans um, and he was brought with truth and with guidance and with uh, light. Meaning what? Nobody's going to say, well, I'm a Yahudi, so I follow Musa alayhi salam, you're Muslim, you, you know, you're Arab and you're Pakistani or Indian or whatever and so you follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi No. He's a Nabi for everybody. That means what? That means if we go to, if we go to Venus, and we find there's actually people living there. And they breathe sulfuric acid instead of oxygen. Then what are you going to do? You're going to give them dawah. And then when they say la ilaha illallah in whatever bizarre alien language they have. And then they come and they, they, they visit earth. And they make tawaf around the Kaaba. And they stand in front of the muajaha sharifa in their suits. You know, and they weep in front of the grave of the Prophet some tears of sulfuric acid which if they didn't have their suit on would be so toxic it would kill everybody in the masjid but that's, their, that's, that's what's going to happen and it's really interesting actually this is not, again it's not the topic of what we're talking about but actually you know uh, the ulama talked about like life on other planets in fact Sayyidina Abdullah bin Abbas there's a whole hadith about it that Mawlana Abdul Hay Laknawi he wrote, wrote a, a, a book about the tahdhirun nas an uh, 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 I forget what it's called the the the, uh, the hadith of Abdullah bin Abbas radiyallahu anhu ma um, they actually wrote about this stuff and uh, it's uh, that you know people because don't, they don't learn arabic and they don't read anything and whatever so you have to learn about it from 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 star wars i guess what you should have learned from the sahaba you learn about from jar jar that's kind of sad isn't it You know, the guy who played Jar Jar was Muslim, you know that, right? That's my conspiracy theory, that's why everyone hates on Jar Jar, because he's the only Muslim in Star Wars, you know? Miskin, they all hate on him, that's like, it's kind of sad. His name's like Ahmed something or another. So, yeah, great. So the, the, this is a, the, the Hawi actually, interestingly enough, the amount of, of material that he gives with regards to the Aqidah about the Prophet Sallallahu it's actually a little bit slim. So I wanted to put a couple of points up uh, with regards to our Aqidah uh, 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 for not only the Prophet Sallallahu but for all the Prophets. That there are three essential, uh, three essential uh, qualities of every Prophet um, that are the prime, the prime qualities that they, they have through which their nubu is administered. Uh, and what are they? We'll, we'll just talk about them quickly. They are what? A sidq wal amana wa tabligh. This is what the Prophet ﷺ were, this is what they embodied, and this is what everything they did, it returns to one or more of these three things. 
One is Sidq, that everything they say is true. Everything that they say is honest and it's true. And you'll see that Rasulullah many times in his life, he will say, I don't know. Right? Was there anyone here at the Jummah Khutbah that I gave? Anyone? I gave a khutbah here, right? So what was it that the Prophet ﷺ, Allah Ta'ala asked the Prophet ﷺ, he says, he said, qala, qala, qala ya Muhammadu, qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, labbayka rabbi. He says, fima yakht, qala fima yakhtasimu al-mala'u al-a'la, qala la adri. And Allah asked him three times. He says, ya Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, he says, labbayk my lord. He says, tell me what is the mala'ul a'la, what are they discussing right now? What is the, the highest of hosts in the heavens, what are they discussing right now? The Prophet said, I don't know. He said, I don't know. And he asked him three times each time, he says, I don't know. Why? Because he was honest about everything. Abu Sufyan went to Sham and he met a rabbi and he told the rabbi, he goes, there's someone amongst us, he claims he's a Nabi and we think he's lying. So give me some questions to ask him that he, he won't know the answer to. And so he gives him three questions. He says that there's no way he's going to know the answer to these. <clears throat> he says ask him about the Dhul Qarnayn and ask him about uh, 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 Ashab al Kahf and ask him about what the nature of the Ruh is. And the Dhul Qarnayn and Ashab al Kahf, it's exceedingly, exceedingly uh, improbable that he would know what their stories are. The Ruh is actually a trick question. Because the answer is that I can't answer that question. And so those three questions, the Prophet wasallam, the mushrikeen would taunt him because they would ask him again and again, day after day, week after week. You know, so many weeks went by and they would ask him this question and he would say, I don't know. And they would make so much fun of him. Some of the mushrikeen started to think maybe this guy is actually telling the truth because nobody would endure this amount of humiliation. If he was a guy who just lied and made stuff up, he would have lied and made something up by now. But it's what that the Prophet the, the Prophet and all the Prophets everything they say is true. Whatever they say, they say with Siddh. The second is amana, trustworthiness. If they say they're gonna do something, they're gonna do it. And if you if you give them uh, something, you trust them with something, they're not gonna be treacherous. It's interesting, people, people, some people know it, some people don't know it. You know the Fath Fath the Fath of Makkah Mukarrama? Uh, um, there is actually a short list of a couple of names. The Prophet ﷺ said, these people, they're not to be forgiven. They're not to be spared. They're, they're to be killed. Even if you find them hanging from the covers of the Kaaba, they're to be killed. So one of the persons whose name was on the list, there's a short list, like Ikrima and Safwan. There's a couple of people. Ikrima and Safwan became Muslims afterward, radiallahu anhum. They escaped. They, didn't, the, they, didn't, they weren't caught by the Sahaba at that time, and they came back with Aman after having declared their Islam. One of them was Ka'b bin Zuhair, the son of the poet. He's the one, the, the, the Sahib Banat Su'ad, uh, the one who wrote the original Qasida Burda, not the one of Busiri. He was a poet, and he used to lampoon and mock the Prophet Sallallahu and say untrue things about him in Jahiliya. And so he was actually on the short list as well. And so what happens is he somehow snuck into the, into the, into the uh, tent where the Rasul Sallallahu was there with his companions. And he walked right in and he said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that I want Aman. The Prophet says, says, go ahead, I give you Aman, I give you safety. What do you want to say? He says, I, I wanted to accept Islam. And so he says his Shahada and he leaves. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says to his companions, he says, didn't I tell you this guy, wherever you find him, you're supposed to kill him. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, if you, even, if, you even, if you even made a gesture with your eyes right now, we would have killed him right on the spot. He says, no, a Nabi is not, kha, kha, Nabi is not kha'in ul-ayn. Right? The Nabi doesn't do kha'in ayun The Nabi is not treacherous, even in his glance, right? Like, you just go, and that's it. They would have whacked him. He would have been done, right? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, no. He asked me for, he, asked, he came in and asked me for safety, and I gave it to him afterward. Uh, uh, afterward, a Nabi is not uh, treacherous in his glance. Even imagine that the messengers that gave the, that delivered the message on behalf of Musaylama, because it's considered to be part of amana to, uh, uh, to uh, allow messengers to deliver the message, come and go without harm coming to them. Because of that, he wanted to have them killed, he didn't have them killed. 
Uh, and so this is a high degree of aman if the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi was a very Machiavellian operator, somebody who was just trying to do stuff you know, based on his own masalih, on his own whatever benefits him, then he, w- he wouldn't have been like that. But every Nabi has a high degree of amana. And then the third thing is tabligh. Tabligh means what? It doesn't mean like going on 40 days and stuff, right? That's what it means for, 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 for the ummah sometimes, right? But for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi what does it mean? It means that whatever part of the message he gets, he delivers all of it without hiding any of it. Allah Ta'ala says in his book, he says, Ya ayyuha rasulu, ballig ma unzila ilayka min rabbika, fa illam tafa'al fama ballagta risalatahu, wa fi qira'atin fama ballagta risalatihi. So Suyuti says that the, 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 the tatbiq between the two qira'at is what? Man katama ba'dahu fa ka'annama katama kullahu. O my, O messenger, Tabli means to make the message completely, uh, to deliver the message completely to its intended audience. He says, O oh Messenger, make this message reach its intended audience. He says that if you don't do so, then you have not fulfilled this tabli. And Wallahu ya'asimuka min nas and Allah Ta'ala will protect you from people. People don't know this in the beginning part of Islam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam actually used to have bodyguards. He would stand watch around his house or they would stand guard when he would be praying because people would try to physically abuse him, harm him, kill him. When this ayah was revealed, Wallahu ya'asimuka minan nas, Allah Ta'ala will protect you from the people. After that, he said, he said to his guards, he said, insarifu, faqad asamani Allahu. That you can go now because Allah has now taken the, 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 the responsibility of protecting me. After that, he never walked around with bodyguards. Right? Neither did Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq, neither did Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, neither did Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu anhu, neither did Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu. None of them used to have bodyguards with them. After the three of them were executed in a row, Sayyidina Muawiyah, then he started having bodyguards. But the, but the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is important, right? Because we talked about infallibility. Why are the prophets infallible? Is it just because they're some sort of super superhuman, like angelic, non-human angelic figure? No. Rather, the isma is directly tied with the tabligh. The infallibility is directly tied with the the delivery of the message, and so our. Our idea of isma in the deen with regards to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam has more. It's 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 more to do with than than just spiritual isma that a person is protected from sin. It's that and it's more. It means that even his physical person is protected. His physical integrity is protected. People will try to kill him. Allah Taala would not allow them to touch him. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam ingested the poison that was given to him in Khaybar. It didn't kill him. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right? The the uh, uh, suraka suraka tubnu Malik, the Bedouin tracker that the the Quraysh uh, uh, sicked on him. He actually found the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he would come near the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. His camel, its feet would start to sink into the sand slowly, and it would sit down because of weight placed on it. And then when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam got a certain distance away, then it could get up and walk. And then he tried to chase him again, and the same thing would happen again and again. Why? Because Wallahu Ya'asimuka min an nas. The isma of the Prophet is connected to what? It's connected to tabligh, to, to him delivering the message. And what happens when the last ayah of the Quran is revealed? What taqu yoman turja'una fihi ila rabbikum? Ila Allahi, not ila rabbikum, ila Allahi, what? So this is the last ayah that's revealed of the Qur'an. After its revelation, what happens? The Prophet ﷺ immediately becomes ill. And he starts to complain even the effect of the poison, all of his old wounds, all of the, 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 the old things that he was protected from before. Now, now uh, they're starting to catch up with him. Why? Because his job in this world was to make tabligh of the, the, the wahi. And once that job is done, now it's time for him to, uh, to leave. This is also, by the way, this is, there's a very subtle ishara in this as well to the ummah. That if the ummah is, is, is occupied with making tabligh of this message to the mankind, its protection will be there with Allah. And then once people want to, uh, you know, as an ummah, as individuals, fine, it's different. But as an ummah, collectively speaking, this obligation of the Prophet is individually, there's no one person who's uh, obliged to carry it like the Prophet was. 
But as an ummah, the entire ummah does, does carry this responsibility that the ummah wants to give up uh, uh, this tabli. And what, by this, I don't mean that you have to, again, you don't have to go on 40 days and you don't have, I mean, you can if you want to and you, you can use another means. But the maqsid is not the jamaat itself, the maqsid is the work, right? The work is what? Taking this message to, uh, to, to, to mankind, in reminding the Muslims about it and telling the, 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 the people of other faiths about it. That as long as the ummah is occupied with this work, the protection of Allah Ta'ala will be there. The miraculous protection of Allah Ta'ala will be there. And once people give it up and, you know, they want to buy a Tesla and, you know, try to save up to buy a house in Toronto, then, then, inshallah, then uh, you know, that's what, uh, that's, what, that's what happened. That's fine, inshallah. Our hour is up. No need to argue about it, inshallah. There's our hour is up. Barakallah, inshallah. What's the schedule now?